you got to be able to get to every word and look at that word and say, this word belongs. It belongs in this book. It belongs in this sentence. It has meaning. And that's, that's hard. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brilliant, your host for this show. I know that I'm incredibly blessed. As the son of self-made billionaires, I've seen the high price some people pay for success, and I've learned that money really can't buy happiness. But I've also had the good fortune to learn directly from many of the world's leading teachers. I created this podcast and the School for Good Living to share what I've learned and to keep exploring the question, what does it mean to live a good life and how can we do it? Despite my privilege, I lived for decades in a pretty dark place, and I know that living is often a painful, difficult, and messy business. But I also know that it can be wonderful beyond imagination, and that it's a skill at which we can improve. That's why every episode is a conversation with an author who's an expert regarding spirituality, health, relationships, work, rest, and play, or money. I also ask my guests about their creative habits, routines, and mindsets, and what they've done to get their books written, published, and read. If you're ready to be, do, have, and give more, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the School for Good Living. If you are an entrepreneur, if you're an artist or a creative of any kind, I think you'll enjoy this conversation with Marcus Whitney. Marcus is author of Create and Orchestrate, The Path to Reclaiming Your Creative Power. I got connected with Marcus through an organization called Nexus. It's a really innovative group of entrepreneurs and philanthropists. And I'm so glad I did. I read his book. I loved it. Marcus's work has been covered by The Atlantic, Fast Company, and TechCrunch. He shares very openly about many, many challenges that he has faced and overcome. Marcus has an incredible life journey from waiting tables seven days a week, teaching himself to code, becoming an entrepreneur, ultimately a venture capitalist, and so much more. In this interview, we talk about how to manage it all, how to stay healthy, how to produce results that we're proud of, how to be there for the people that matter for us. Marcus is also co-founder and minority owner of Nashville Soccer Club, Nashville's MLS team. Marcus is someone I find to be incredibly inspirational. His example, his work ethic, the lessons that he has learned and shares with others. You can learn more about Marcus at marcuswhitney.com. You can find him on pretty much every social media channel. With that, I hope you enjoy this conversation with my new friend, Marcus Whitney. Marcus, welcome to the School for Good Living. Thank you for having me here, Brilliant. I'm really excited. Me too. Will you tell me, please, what's life about? Wow, great question to start this with. I have to admit, I am currently in one of those phases where I'm asking myself that. I really am. I'm asking myself, what, what is life about? I can tell you what my life is about today. That's about what I think I can get through. And my life today is about making sure that I show up in the world for the people that depend on me in a way that honors their honors how important they are to me and to do meaningful work every day that makes me feel like I have a purpose for living. That's, you know, that's a that's about where I am right now. I think that. I'm very confused by all of the external stimulus of life, right? So, so the parts that I can ground in and wake up and go to sleep with every day and find consistency in are those two things. It's how I show up for the people that, that matter to me and the work that I'm doing. That work feeling meaningful and feeling like it is going to make the world a better place. That's about it. I'm curious, do you have any kind of a life purpose statement, like a written statement that guides you or any kind of a, a credo or a mission that you follow? It's really interesting. I have them and then I don't allow them to, to limit how life experiences will shape me. So the last one that I crafted was that my purpose is to inspire good people to tap into their creative power. That was the last one that I wrote. The work that I've been doing over the last two months, maybe it, maybe that's what it is, but it's, it's starting to evolve as the world is evolving. And as I'm seeing opportunities that I feel that I'm uniquely qualified to lean into. So that was the last one that I had. Okay. When I hear you respond that way, I'm 
I'm reminded how any one of us is so much more than anything we could say to describe ourselves. So, of course, a purpose statement would naturally be limiting, right? And I love that your way of living is to be free from the constraints of that and open to reinvention or, you know, just pursuing possibility. Okay, so thanks for that. I, I like to to have this as a question. I figure a listener, before they know much about you, of course, by now they'll have heard the intro and a little bit about your your bio and that kind of thing, but there's nothing like hearing it in your own words. Would you share with me and people listening, when people ask who you are and what you do, how do you typically answer that question or how do you like to answer that question? Yeah, people are typically asking me what I do. That's that, that's that, you know, even if they say like, you know, who are you? They're, they're really sort of asking me like what I do. And, and I, I generally respond and say, I'm an entrepreneur because that is the vehicle in which I fit all of the different creative things that I'm doing that, that I claim ownership of. I'm engaged from a civic perspective. So I'm, I'm involved in different nonprofits and I'm a commissioner for Metro arts, which is the agency for arts for the city of Nashville. You know, I, I, I do things for my community. Certainly I'm a father and a husband and a son and, and a brother and, and those things as well. Right. So I've got, I've got those, those labels, but generally speaking, people are asking me more about like my particular path in life. Um, not the things that, you know, most humans share. And generally I'll say I'm an entrepreneur. Okay. I feel I should have probably asked that question in the nexus way, which is what are you passionate about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, right. I am passionate about creativity. I am passionate about innovation. I am passionate about solving problems. I am passionate, although I would say I am right now maybe slightly overwhelmed with, but I am passionate about the idea that at this very, very epic arc in the human story that we're going to figure this thing out. And I think I feel responsibility for that, figuring it out, not falling on my shoulders alone, but certainly constantly trying to send out signals and find the rest of us in the community, uh, this, you know, this global human race community that, that also feel the sense of urgency around that. And and uh, are trying to figure out how do we work together given all the constraints and the challenges and the realities of the world, right? Like how, what's the, how do we thread this needle and figure it out? That's sort of the subset of, of, of things that I'm, that I'm passionate about. You know, I, I have things that are part of my background because of how I was raised and, and those things are sort of baked into me. So like I'm passionate about hip hop, right? Because I grew up in Brooklyn and it was the first form of music that really swept me away. But I'm now 44 and I'm, I mean, I have no idea when this is going to be uh, published, but I'll be 45 December 30th. So if it's before or after, you know, I'm at this age where I can go for many, many days without listening to hip hop. You know what I mean? And when I listen to it, it does light up something in me from, from my youth and it makes me, and it does inspire me and I, and I really love it. But it's not the thing, it's not a sustained everyday thing, right? The sustained everyday things are tapped into my work. And so I'm trying to, I'm always trying to make sure that the things that I'm choosing to spend large amounts of my time on align with that passion, you know, and 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 that I'm not divergent from that. I believe that's why I constantly identify as an entrepreneur, because I believe that entrepreneurs have the power to control their time, whereas employees don't. That's the, the, the core, you know, the core of a employee contract is uh, at least historically has been about an exchange of time, value, and money. Right. And so entrepreneurs sort of escape that paradigm and have more control of their time. And so utilizing my time in, in a way that feels aligned with, with that passion of being part of the great solution is, yeah. is, you know, is really important to me. You share on your website, some things, it's kind of a CV. It's kind of your resume, your personal history, your work history, all a little bit rolled into one. And you share some things that aren't typical for successful entrepreneurs to, to, uh, I would say, you know, share like you, you make a, a list of challenges overcome, which I thought was pretty amazing. You say dropping out of college, alcohol abuse, divorce and dysfunctional relationships, failed companies, poor eating habits, physical inactivity, bad credit, isolation, prejudice, self-doubt. Right now, many of us have faced those things. Not all of us have overcome them 
or some of them maybe we never totally overcome. But in your book, Create and Orchestrate, the path to reclaiming your creative power, you share more about that journey. But what, and, you, and one of the things you say is that alignment, alignment is a long process, creating alignment within ourselves is a long process. So all that is to, to ask this question, how have you faced those things and how have you managed to overcome them? Well, part of overcoming them is putting them out there, uh -huh. right? So that's part of my process of dealing with them is not letting them live in the closet, right? But putting sunshine on them so that they, so that they're not even demons. They're just, they're just challenges, right? They're just parts of my journey that I went through and I'm not ashamed of them, you know, and I, I frame them as challenges overcome because that at least gives me a framework to feel a sense of uh, accomplishment in terms of having moved through them. And I can put them out to the world to sort of say they're, they're part of me. They don't go away. Like I'm still divorced. I'm still someone who did uh, abuse alcohol. I'm still someone, yeah, I still suffer prejudice, you know? And so uh, I still deal with, with self-doubt. So their challenges overcome, not in a permanent state, but more in a, I'm engaging with them openly in a much more healthy way, you yeah. know, and I'm, and I'm trying to be friends with them actually. Right. You know, I'm trying to be friend with my, with my uh, background with alcohol, you know, and, you know, I, I'll even refer to a lot of those times as good times and fun times. They weren't all good and fun times, but, you know, <laughs> some, but some of them were not good enough to go back to it. But, you know, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to have the right relationship with all the versions of myself. Right. And not have any version of myself relegated to a closet where it can't come out, you know, because I feel like if I do that, it will come out in a really sort of nasty, weird way. I, so I did it for me. What I have learned since doing that is it has deeply enriched the quality of the conversations I'm, I'm able to have with people who do take the time to read that, right? Because I think they know that everything I listed there is just a human experience thing. Right. And they sort of know that I know that. And so it invites them to have a richer conversation which is great because I don't have to prompt that rich conversation. Right. You know yeah. what I mean? They know I'm open for it. They know I'm open for it. I've sort of laid it out there. I'm open for it and it invites them to have it. And I think oftentimes maybe they, they really want to have it because they don't get to have it enough. And so I feel like the quality of my conversations has exponentially improved, you know, since, since I've decided to, to do this. And I think that's one of the reasons to tell your stories, to take the time to try to reflect on your story. And uh, that's what, that's what I tried to do in, in my book. I really enjoyed this book and I took away a lot from it, even though I'm an entrepreneur and I've grown up in a family of entrepreneurs, you helped me to see some things newly or maybe understand them more completely. And, and I'm really grateful for that. And, and a lot of it came from you sharing again, your own personal journey. And some of it is just, is really remarkable. Like you open uh, pretty early in the book, you talk about the story when you moved, I think it was from Atlanta. Yeah. In Nashville, yeah. right? And you yeah. were wearing a T-shirt for the restaurant where you had worked. Will you share that story? I thought that as a demonstration of your ethic and just your who you are, it was really remarkable. Yeah. So, so at that time in my life, I was waiting tables so frequently, meaning you know, generally six days a week, that on any given day I would be wearing. The uniform. And I think the reason why I was wearing it might have been because I had just worked a shift the day before and like we had packed up everything. So I didn't even have a, a different set of clothes to wear as we were making the move. So I think I had like worked a shift, gone home, probably gotten some sleep. And the next morning we woke up and we drove into town and I'm like wearing the uniform. It takes four hours to get from Atlanta to Nashville. So I got there around lunchtime. It was Labor Day. And the restaurant Rio Bravo was packed and I'm wearing a, a Rio Bravo shirt. It's probably most of what my wardrobe was at the time. I probably had, you know, enough uniform shirts to, to, to rotate those. And yeah, I, I walked into the restaurant. We, we, we drove into town and we drove uh, down Broadway and that's the best way to sort of see Nashville. If you've never seen it for the first time, that's, a, that's a chance to kind of get the sense of 
why they call it Music City. You know, you drive down Broadway and you see all the different honky tonks and, and things like that. And okay. And you keep driving and Broadway turns into West End uh, as you're moving west away from the river. And lo and behold, I see a Rio Bravo sign. So we pull into the into the into the driveway. And keep in mind, this is the year 2000. So we don't have phones, right? So th- it's not like I knew all of the different things that I was going to encounter when I got there. It just so happened that Rio Bravo was a pretty popular restaurant at the time and it, and they had a really nice location on West End. I pulled into the, into the parking lot. The place was packed, um, as Rio Bravo often was. And I walked in, I found the manager because I knew sort of what the managers would look like in those restaurants and said, hey, I'm new to town, but I'm in the system. Uh, Real Bravo had a corporate system. He looked me up, saw me in the system. They were slammed, gave me a set of tables. I ran back out to the car and I said, I've got a shift. (laughs) And told (laughs) told my then wife to go find us a place to stay. And I worked a shift. And uh, then she came back at the end again, like we're not really in the cell phone era, right? (laughs) You know, so she found uh, a week to week hotel and I had some money and that, that landed us in town. That's amazing. And, and then you share this story too, around this, this part of the book where you, you were working with some women, uh, some women who were incarcerated, helping them to learn principles of entrepreneurship. How did that come about? And what was that experience like? Yes. So the program you're referring to is called uh, best And it is a program that teaches entrepreneurship to incarcerated people. And the woman who founded it is a wonderful, wonderful soul. Her name is Karen Vandermolen. Uh, She recently retired and and someone new has has, uh, replaced her as the executive director. But Karen was working out of Nashville's Entrepreneur Center, where I spent a lot of time uh, with a tech accelerator I was running at the time. And... She just said, hey, Marcus, I'd really love it if you would come out to the prison and if you would speak to... And were you still serving tables at this time or had you made a transition? No, no, no. Yeah, no. I I had transitioned at this point. Okay. Yeah. This is probably a good eight or nine years later. Uh, Oh, okay. Eight or nine years later. I would not have been fit to do this, uh, you know, at that time. But I, you know, I went in and I just, you know, this was a really moving experience because... I went into the prison. The first thing that happens is you sort of get, you go through the intake where, you know, you get searched, you go through all the metal detectors and things of that nature. And you kind of go through a series of doors that, that seal off the outside world. And then you're on the inside, right? And then you get, you get escorted through and it's very cold. It's very sterile. I've spent a short amount of time in a, in a prison before. And so, you know, it's, it's a very, you know, you know that you're in a place that is designed to make people feel less than human. It's it's in the design. Right? It's in the design. And go through these halls and arrive at this room that's basically set up like a classroom. It's a classroom setting. And walk in, and there's a you know a room full of women, young adults to probably middle aged, largely Arrested Development going on. So they're in there, they're having fun. You know, they're excited that someone is, is there to, you know, enrich their time there. Right. I mean, you think about, this is probably a highlight for them, you know, in the time that they're spending there pouring into them, it's a chance for them to not think about what they're currently going through and to think about what they're going to do when they become uh, returned citizens. And it really hit me while I was there. This is the power of entrepreneurship. You know, this is a very real, very viable path for a returning citizen where so many other paths are closed to them, right? And so I had largely been seeing entrepreneurship through my own lens of someone who didn't have a credential, didn't have a college degree, and how it was a path alternative to that where I could still be influential and, you know, tap into my own power and, and, and accumulate wealth and be able to take care of my family and stuff like that. But here it became even more impactful to, to be there and to, and to share my story with them and, and to, to hear their stories. And now I'll tell you, so that was, that was 10 years ago, you know, it's 10 years later, some of those women have returned to society 
and have gone on to do incredible things like start nonprofits, you know, and they run nonprofits. And, and it's, you know, it was definitely one of the most important moments in terms of me knowing I needed to write a book, right? Knowing, knowing that my story was important, knowing that, that, that my, and also other people, you know, it's like sharing your story and the exact reason why, why we're doing this, this podcast today, right? You know, this, this is one of the most powerful things that humans can do, you know, is reflect on our lives, share our stories and and inspire other people. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And, and one of the things that I'm often just really blown away by is how I think we don't recognize the power of our own story, you know, and we don't know what other people, not only do we not know what they've been through, we don't know what they don't know and this kind of thing. And I was reminded of that when you talk about how one of the women that you connected with that day didn't even know what entrepreneurship meant, right? That just seems like, doesn't everybody know that? But, but she didn't. That was particularly relevant for me because we, we, we went through this, this, phase with social media where people were talking about hustle porn and and started to make these these really strong judgments about you know you have to be born an entrepreneur and it was just all this like weird privilege in that right which 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 for me was saying you're saying that because you're surrounded by these people who of course they know what it is it's built in for them but that's you know you're excluding huge huge segments of our society Right. Yeah. That that was the point I was trying to make is there are all these segments of society that have never seen or heard of an entrepreneur. They don't know what it means. They don't know what it is. And we, we need to stop forgetting about them. Yeah. Well, and, and you even mentioned in the book about how growing up, you weren't necessarily taught entrepreneurship, even though you were raised by an entrepreneur. That's right. That's right. right? It's the difference between something being explicitly stated and being implicitly experienced. You know, and entrepreneurship is a little, it's not that obvious. Like when you're, you know, when you're, you're looking at the world and you're looking at the economy and, and everyone works for a living, right? What's the difference between the person who runs the business or works for the business, right? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like, even as I say it, I know that it seems very obvious, but think about the child growing up, just looking at the world, right? Yep. Yep. How would the child looking at a company and being in an office, how would the child know who owns the business versus who works in the business? How would the child know that? Right. Yeah. Even if it's their own mother, unless it's explicitly stated, I don't just work here. This is my business. Okay. Well, what is my, what does that mean? That's a concept. Yep. Right. What does that mean? That means there's an entity that I own and these people work for that entity, but I own it. So they kind of work for me and I'm writing the checks that they get paid. And if there's not enough money, I probably need to pay them before I get paid. And, you know, all of these, these are concepts. They're not obvious things. Yeah. Like the sky is blue. (laughs) Yeah. My dad had a saying, he, he used to say, nothing is obvious to everyone. (laughs) Yes. I love that. I love that. That's it. That's exactly it. Well, and, and I think, I think you and my dad actually have a lot of similarities, not just for the entrepreneurial spirit, but also for the fact that you're both very much teachers, right? And, and I love something you said about that experience connecting with those, those incarcerated women. You said, it's my job to spread the word about the power of entrepreneurship. I'm going to say that again. It's my job to spread the word about the power entrepreneurship offers and let those who hear the word use it in whatever way best helps them. Right. And that's just, I, I think that's so magnificent because it's not preaching at people. It's not forcing them or threatening them to change. It's, it's teaching them, it's empowering them, it's inspiring them. And as I said just a few minutes ago about, I learned a lot from your book about what you've come up with through study and trial and effort and error about the eight core concepts, which I want to ask about just generally. I know we could do a whole conversation just yeah. on that. Yeah. But before I do, let me go here because you, you, I love this inquiry. It's like the road trip conversation about the four burners theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. About, is it true that something's got to give, we've got to sacrifice something for our success. And I really appreciate the perspective that you offer 
in the book. And I know not everybody's heard of the four burners theory. We've probably all experienced some version of it yes. <laughs> ourselves, but would you be willing to talk about the four burners thing and what your particular view of it is? Yes. So the four burners theory is a bit of a mystery. People think David Sedaris came up with it, but it's hard to actually attribute that. But most people do attribute it to him. It is a framework for thinking about life balance. I won't even say work-life balance, life balance, right? And it offers the analogy that if you've ever spent time in a kitchen cooking, you know, trying to keep four burners going at the same time on your stove is a pretty difficult thing. Yes, there are four burners there, but if you're trying to deliver a great dish and all four burners are on, something probably gets burned, right? Or something gets undercooked. It's just difficult to sort of maintain that level of focus. That's the analogy. So then you take that analogy and you apply aspects of life to the four burners. And those, those, those aspects of life are work, health, family, and friends. And the idea is that in order to, to, cook a great dish, right? You need to kind of pare it down to two burners. Okay. And, and that's, you know, I think most people who have cooked would say, yeah, if I got two burners going, I can nail it. If I got four burners going, mm, uh, something's going to get burned or, or undercooked unless I'm just, you know, incredible at balancing. Right. And so the analogy then goes in order to be exceptional at any of these aspects of life, you have to turn down some of the other burners. And so Typically, what people will say is, if you look at entrepreneurs, they are often, they're, they're definitely choosing work, and then they're picking between their health, family, and friends. You know, they're picking one of those three. That's that's kind of what people will say. And then maybe they fit two of them in, but usually one of them goes by the wayside. That's kind of how it's, how it's laid out. And so I love the four burners, not because I totally buy into it, but because I love that it, it brings these four aspects of life front and center. And it does offer a framework for contemplating your own life with, with, you know, in the, in the, in the mindset of those four burners and just asking yourself, well, you know, what do I really do? And I think it also offers you an opportunity to better design a life to make different work decisions, right. Where you can still be focused on work. I mean, the, the easiest one to sort of call out is if you have significant management responsibilities in work, then I would say, yeah, it really does get difficult because management is a very time and energy reliant activity. Okay. Management of other people, right? Is it just, it just is to do a good job at it. And so if you're a manager and that's part of your work, manager of people, then it really does force you just by the constraints of time to think about those other three burners. You can, however, design a work life where management is not part of it. And I think if you do that, you you offer yourself more time and flexibility on the other three burners, right? So that's that's kind of one of the design uh, opportunities you have when you really sort of think about the the four burners and you contemplate them. No, thank you for sharing that. And and again, you know, that's something that I think I know I know I found valuable. I suspect many readers do is that your book takes these, you know, experiences that we find ourselves in. We're working, we're in a relationship, you know, we're doing our best to manage our health, and and you give these frameworks that help us think through them, approach them more intelligently. And one of them is, is we just touched on was this idea of the eight core concepts is something that has helped you in, in your career to, to probably not only maintain your sanity, but to produce some pretty remarkable results. How do you describe what, what is the eight core concepts and how did you arrive at it? Yeah. So again, college dropout, never actually formally studied business and was, as I decided to engage in business full-time as an entrepreneur would consistently run into problems because I did not understand how businesses worked. Okay. That's the, that's the, the real reason. What I knew was software development. I had a very strong background in software development through experience. I wasn't traditionally or classically trained as a software developer either, but through experience and through doing, I learned that. And one of the most important things I pulled away from that was this concept of frameworks. Okay, and, and real quick, Marcus, if I may just jump in here, because yeah. I think the listener will find this interesting and valuable, that you taught yourself programming while serving tables six days a week by going to bookstores and reading the books in the bookstore, right, to a large degree. So this is like a self-taught thing that you made a choice. I'm not just going to get by serving tables, but you were improving and, and, and educating and expanding yourself along the way. That's, that's pretty significant. Yeah, thank you for catching that. That's a pretty important part of the story. And 
And, and it actually plays a lot into the, the A core concepts because one of the things, and you're actually highlighting something I didn't say early on, you know, talking about passion, but I'll, but I'll say it now because it's clear when you say it and I heard it, it resonated. Um, I am passionate about learning and self-guided, self-directed learning. I love to learn, right? I love to read. I love to explore. I love to research. I love to try things. I love to experiment, right? And so when I talk about like innovation, I, I also mean I love to, to grow and develop and learn and uh, teaching myself code. I was backed into a corner. I had a necessity there. But when I was successful in that, when I was able to pick up those books and practice and then get that job and then spend the next eight years of my life as a technologist, you know, going from waiting tables to making six figures and earning equity in a multi-million dollar company, right? All through the ability to teach myself how to code and then practice and become better at that. But um, when I went through that and I had that, that experience, that stuck, right? That, oh, I can teach myself things and there's efficacy there. It's not just like a hobby. I can teach myself something that will deliver practical value in the world and therefore practical value for me and my family, right? Okay. And so I applied the same thing with entrepreneurship, but I found entrepreneurship to be far more complex than technology. Technology is pretty one-dimensional. It's you and the computer. Once you learn all of the different aspects of programming in the web, and you know, I can I can list them very quickly, right? It's like you have to learn about the protocols that that transfer information back and forth. You have to learn about the constraints of processing power and storage. You have to learn about programming languages, and you have to learn about you know how you're dealing with 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 memory and information, and do you store it short term or do you store it long term? What are you trying to achieve? Like you know. That's that's basically what you need to know. And then, then it's just about programming, programming, programming. You're just delivering business far more multidimensional than that. Literally massive differences in context. Okay. Massive differences in context in business. And when I first started my entrepreneurial career, I had experience as a programmer. So I had experience in product development. I had experience in customer service. I had some experience in sales. So I, so I knew, you know, a lot of these things about like how to deliver value in the market. I was very underprepared on the internal aspects of a business, how to actually like uh, lead people. I was completely in the dark on finance, completely in the dark. I didn't know what I didn't know about finance. It's pretty common for entrepreneurs. <laughs> right. I didn't know what I didn't know about finance. Yeah. I was very poor on operations, especially when it came to things like contract and compliance and, and, and risk management. And I did not understand that a business is a dynamic thing, not a static thing. And so over time it grows and it almost becomes an entirely new business. You know, I had experienced this at the last company that I was at before I started my, my, my business. I started as the fifth employee. When I left, there was 50 people. I left because it was a different company four years later through that growth, but I didn't understand how difficult it would be as a leader that as the company grows, you literally have to kind of reinvent the company. Yeah. You have to change your finance protocols. You have to change your operating standards. You have to change the product to some degree. You have, you know, all of the things about the business are constantly changing. And so I created the eight core concepts really when I started to work on the book, because I, I wanted to say, okay, I've learned these things. I've created these rules in my head, but how would I communicate this as a framework to, to myself 10 years ago, right? How would I do that? And I thought the answer was I would create a framework. In software development, there are things called application frameworks, okay? People may have heard of things like Ruby on Rails. I'm, I'm trying to think about, you know, things that would somewhat be out there in, in general pop culture. Ruby on Rails probably would be one of the bigger ones, uh, one of the bigger app frameworks, but they might not know what Ruby on Rails does. What Ruby on Rails does is it creates a container for a piece of software, a piece of web software, and it handles all of the core things that that piece of software has to do. So you don't have to do it every time, right? Every application needs authentication. Authentication is like user password you know, okay, you're, you're clear. You can now see what's behind the gate. Okay. You can't think of an application that you use that doesn't need that. Right. But should you have to like write that every single time? 
Probably not. So the framework takes care of that for you. And there's a bunch of other things, security, session management, et cetera. And so I thought about business the same way. I was like, every single business has like a core set of things that I don't care what kind of business I'm doing. There is a core set of things in that business. How would I frame that up? How would I frame that up? And that's where the eight core concepts came from. I, I tried to find the most essential things. I tried to think about what order, what's the order of operations around them, and how, how do they influence each other? And how do I distill each one of these concepts, which I ended up landing on? How do, how do, I, how do I distill each one of these concepts into its most pure purpose statement? And that's, that's what the, the eight core concepts is. Awesome. And, and two other things, I know we haven't mentioned the eight yet, yeah. but the other things I thought were interesting and, and useful ways of understanding the whole thing is this about inheritability and about the inside the building and outside the building. So maybe if you're willing to just list, if you would just list the eight and tell us what is inheritability, why does it matter? And then how are they broken out that inside the building and outside the building? Yep. Okay. So let's first list them. So in order, leadership, Finance, operations, growth, product, service, sales, marketing. Those are the eight core concepts, and that is their order. The first four are the ones that are in the building, meaning they're they are largely focused on your company, your the your employees, your team, your board, the the internals. The last four, product, service, sales, and marketing, are are largely focused on the market and and your customers. So they're outside the building. The concept of inheritance is one that I that I stole from object-oriented programming. Uh, again, this is a software thing. And it's this idea that there is a relationship between these different concepts. And that order that I listed them in is an inheritance order. So what that means is that leadership is like the super concept. It's the core of the core concepts. It's the first one. It's the absolute essential one. Everything else depends on it. It's at the center. If you don't have leadership, you don't have a business. Okay. Finance comes right after it. And finance adds on a whole new layer of things, right? But it has to bring all of the aspects of leadership along with it. Or it, it independent of leadership, is nothing. And then operations then inherits everything from leadership and finance and so forth and so on. So when you get down to marketing, that very last concept, it inherits from all of the previous ones all of the previous ones, like marketing, the whole purpose of marketing is to generate demand. So it goes out in the market and it's communicating about the product. It's enabling sales. It's communicating the brand and, it, and it's telling you about the kind of service you're going to be able to expect. It has to be able to do it in a way that's going to grow the business. It has to be operationally true. You don't want to lie in your marketing, right? And it's it's reliant on the finance and it's got to communicate the brand the brand promise, which is, which is leadership. So marketing is the most complete of the concepts because it, it inherits all of them, but it's also the lowest on the, on the totem pole, right? So people who want to start with marketing, but don't have solid foundations in leadership and finance, you're, you're screwed. You're totally screwed because you're, because you're, you're selling an empty house. Yeah. One of like, what I love about this so much is, is whether someone is at the early stages, they're just thinking about entrepreneurship, they're exploring it, or they're already in it. They're in the messy process that it is. You know, this is such a useful way to A, understand, but B, potentially, you know, refine what it is we're trying to do or, or more clearly identify where are my deficiencies or, or whatever and how can I, you know, shore those up, whether it's by educating myself or bringing somebody onto the team, you know. So I, I thought that was really valuable and I, I'm grateful to you for, for putting it down and sharing it, you know, putting it down in the book and then sharing it here today. Thank you. It's, it's a, look, businesses are complex. Trying to distill them down to a framework that is universally applicable and reasonably easy to understand is a, is a difficult task. It's, it's one that I, that I took on and I tried to tackle because that was what I was trying to do. I was trying to find a way to uh, help anybody in, inside of a couple of chapters understand what the makeup of a business is. It's difficult. It's difficult to do. Businesses are very, very complex or complex organisms. What's that that Mark Cuban says about it's I forget how he words it, but about the the sport that it never stops. That's right. right? It's like the eternal game, basically. That's right. That's right. I love that he says that. You're not you're not taking me in this direction, but I just have to say this. It's also one of the reasons why I care so much about well-being. 
why I care so much about the quality of my sleep and about not drinking and about working out and about, you know, meditating is because I finally came to recognize that entrepreneurship is a sport. It's competitive. It is a sport. It does have rules. It does have scoreboards. And you would never find any athlete in any sport that was serious about competing and being successful, not taking care of themselves. You'd never find that. And so it changed my understanding about how critical well-being is for, for entrepreneurship. Well, something you talk about, you know, and I, I'm really grateful to for you talking about this and the example that your life is, because something that was super formative for me was watching my dad. You know, although he was extraordinarily successful, he paid a very high price having his legs amputated at the age, you know, due to complications from diabetes, dying at age 64, you know, and despite having all of this success and all of this uh, recognition and making pretty incredible contributions, I, I've spent a lot of time wondering, was he really successful? You know, and it's not my place to say, but it certainly caused me to ask a lot of questions and, and something you say about a time budget, right? Because as far as we experience this life as a human being, we do have only 168 hours every week and someday those will end, right? And we have things we want and we have commitments that we've made and like all this kind of thing. And it can be very challenging to navigate that, especially without frameworks and, you know, clarity and this kind of thing. Will you talk about how do you think about time? Why do you talk about a time budget? How do you do it? What advice do you have for others? Like anything in that direction? Yeah, I, I don't want to start talking about that without referencing uh, what you said about your father. And my father is 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 still alive, has has diabetes. And, you know, I think it's impossible to talk about the time budget or time and the concept of success without recognizing that we as humans have evolved and our understanding of success and our understanding of what life is supposed to be and how we're supposed to prioritize things has evolved. It really has, you know, and I think previous generations, I'm fortunate enough to be able to see that difference in prioritization and understanding of our control of time and our, and our full definition of success vis-a-vis my, my father, you know, sort of how he has accepted where he is at this age and what his body will allow him to do versus what I expect and the trajectory I hope to be on when I am his age. And, uh, I think that is the time budget. The time budget is about our understanding about our life and second order thinking. You know, how we spend our time today will absolutely undeniably have an impact on our future. It it will. It definitely will. And it's the one resource that is truly not recoverable. And so when you know that and when you have a higher set of expectations for the full body of your life, don't you want to be more thoughtful and intentional and strategic about how you quote unquote spend your time? Right. And so that is that is that's the underlying reason. That's the why behind a time budget, right? Is that we're we're evolving. We're understanding that we can be in our in our 80s and still be really, really healthy. I mean really healthy. You know what I mean? Yeah which I didn't used to believe. And now I absolutely do. This is right. These are pretty new beliefs that we have now as humans, we have evolved. Right. And so the time budget is, uh, is a little bit of a, of a, of a nod to the four burners, right? It's this sense that my impact does have some in the equation that is my impact on the world. My longevity fits in there somewhere. Right on a couple of levels. One, just the amount of time that I'm here does impact the amount of work I'm going to be able to do. Not not sort of that my legacy will do after I'm gone, but that the actual work I'm here to do while I'm breathing. Two, as I get older, I get wiser. And the quality of my work and the precision does get better. It does. And so I want to be able to do work longer. And I need a healthy body and brain to do that. So that fits in there. Then it gets into, well, what makes a happy, a healthy body and brain? Well, some of it's nutrition, some of it's sleep, some of it's being well-adjusted emotionally and mentally, right? And there's a lot of upkeep 
that goes into that. There's a lot of maintenance that goes into that, you know, and, and, and each one of us has uh, a different makeup. And so we each have a different recipe of what that looks like for us. Right. But for me, that means got to have some therapy time, got to have some time outside running and getting some fresh air and sunlight, got to do, you know, intermittent fasting pretty regularly to, you know, sort of screw around with my hormones, got to, you know, take time to spend in the kitchen, actually preparing meals, got to get to bed at a certain time, got to make sure I have regular check-ins with friends, some of them serendipitous, some of them sort of planned and locked in and committed, you know, and then there's like, committed time to work. There's committed time to family. There's committed time to myself, personal time. It's not perfect, but it's just the the purpose of planning is to be thoughtful and to, and to be more aware, you know, and to get closer to executing better in, in line with your values and your, and your hopes and dreams even. Right. And so that's, to me, that's the, that's the, that's the why behind the time budget. Ah, thank you for sharing that. Well, there's, ah, there's so much, even still, I want to ask, I do want to keep us rolling forward, but man, I want to ask you what you've learned about making partnerships work. I want to ask you about, I love what you say, you differentiate between mistakes and showstoppers. I want to ask you what else you want to talk about. But one thing for sure, I, I would love to get your view about is uh, it's about belief. It's about belief in yourself. And as you just talked about second order thinking that there will be consequences for the choices we make and the way we live now. There will be. So there's there's always a future that we're living into. But something you said in the book about how you became a programmer, when you say, I didn't achieve that mind state by believing I was becoming a programmer. I achieved that mind state by believing I already was a programmer, right? And that can sound a lot of ways, I'm sure. It can sound like positive thinking, happy hoping. It can sound like uh, semantics, or just a little thing, but will you talk a little bit about how can we, because I guess the bigger question is how can we become, how can we be, see, even in the question, how can we be what it is we want to be, or we're committed to being and not be in this perpetual state of becoming or wanting. If there is anything I've learned through the process of writing this book, I know we're not in the part where we have to really get into the writing stuff, but there's anything I've learned through the process of writing a book. It is that words matter. Words matter. And semantics matter. And when people don't lean into that, they're either trying to fool themselves or they're trying to fool you, right? One of the two. But the world operates on precision, ultimately. Ultimately, the world, the universe operates on precision, right? And and so the words that you choose in terms of how you frame yourself they force downstream decisions and they force analysis of current activities that may not be possible if you don't choose those words. So I can be an aspiring programmer forever. If I say I am a programmer, well, now programmers do certain things and I got to do the things that programmers do in order to be a programmer. Otherwise, I'm not a programmer. I'll tell you one thing I've been struggling with on this front. Because of COVID-19, I am not practicing martial arts. And I have not referred to myself as a martial artist for the, for the last four or five months. Because I'm not practicing martial arts. I can't wait to get back to being a martial artist. Right now, it would be too difficult and too painful to keep calling myself a martial artist. Because it would be a reminder of the, the fact that I can't really do it. When I called myself a programmer, I didn't qualify it and say, I'm a good programmer, a bad programmer. I'm an unemployed programmer. I'm an employed programmer. I just said, I'm a programmer. And programmers program. So, you know, and programmers study new programming languages. That's what the, those are things programmers do. And programmers talk to other programmers. So when I said that, even though I was working as a waiter, I couldn't just be a waiter. I had to find where the user groups were, where the other programmers were. I had to, after I was done waiting tables, go work on my programs, right? I had to do the, th- I had to allocate my time in the way that a programmer would because I said I was a programmer. That's why. That's, that's why belief is, is so important because belief shapes reality. Yeah, no doubt. And I realize that so often we, this is, okay, <laughs> there's so much here because I remember the day I learned 
we can generate certainty for ourselves in the absence of evidence or agreement, right? We can choose to believe something, even if no one else believes it, even if there's nothing to support it, right? In terms of I've done this, here's the proof, that kind of thing. But what's your experience on how can we create and sustain the belief? I mean, you're saying a programmer programs, an X does whatever X does. So there's an element of declaration here. And then there's an element probably of integrity where we're now in integrity with what we have declared for ourselves. And it sounds super easy. Like when you say it, like if it's said that way, right? But what have you seen about the times when we do grapple with self-doubt or maybe even other people's disapproval, disagreement, that kind of thing? How do we persist? How do we keep moving forward in the face of, you know, that adversity, the absence of evidence, you know, that kind of thing? Well, that's just fear. And that's, and that's very natural. And we all experience it. And so I believe that some of it is living with the fear long enough to process it, to to come to the, the logical and that it's not fatal. You know, that whatever that thing is that you're fearing is probably not fatal. And it's probably mostly uncomfortable. And you're probably sensitive to the pain, that, you know, that it's going to cause you. But the pain is only temporary. And so, you know, to me, some of this is just maturity, right? Like when you're younger, fear is much more powerful because there's much more of an unknown, you know, and you have so you have you have much less autonomy, and you have, you have a smaller body of experience behind you to know that you've survived things that you feared. But as you get older and you get more mature, you've got this body of experience to know, okay, pain is temporary. I've survived many, many, many of the things that I've feared. I've survived many of the things that I that was very very, very difficult, but I did, but I did survive. I, I am, I am inherently a pretty resilient being. And sometimes it's just like, you know, the, the easiest way is to just, is, is to simply move through it. Right. And to kind of just, just, uh, know that the, the things that you fear that are painful are massive opportunities for growth and, and, and development and change. And, and now this is all very logical and rational. This, you know, much easier, <laughs> much easier said than done, but yeah. you know, we're, we're having a conversation about it, right? I'm dealing with something right now on the business front that is very uncomfortable. And even as we're talking about it and, you know, you're mentioning words like integrity, it's like, I know what I need to do. I know what I need to do in order to do what for the rest of my life, when I look back on this moment, I will say, you absolutely did this the right way. I know exactly what the what the thing is to do, okay? But it's painful because it it's it's going to create a little bit more extra work and there's some unknowns and I'm sort of putting something in somebody else's hands and they could say no and then that'll require sort of a chain reaction of things. But that's you know, <laughs> so, I mean So here we are. The journey are. never like, ends. Yep. Nothing I just said means I get out of it. So right. you know what I mean? <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Okay. With your permission, I want to go ahead and transition to the enlightening lightning round. Question number one, please complete the following sentence with something other than a box of chocolates. Life is like a massive multiplayer online game where you only get one life. All right. Number two, here I'm borrowing Peter Thiel's famous question. What important truth do very few people agree with you on? Probably relatively true. I think I believe that we have to drastically and swiftly change our behaviors as humans over the course of the next five years if we're going to make it as a civilization. Mm. Okay, thank you. Question number three. If you were required every day for the rest of your life to wear a t-shirt with a slogan on it or a phrase or a saying or a quote or a quip, what would the shirt say? I already made that shirt. It says create. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Number four, what book other than your own have you gifted or recommended most often? Mm. Gosh, I should have better answers for these questions. I really should. It's so interesting that I don't. And what that tells you is I really, I really don't recommend books to people. Uh, I really don't recommend. Books I don't like. I don't like recommending books to people. It's interesting. I, I'll try to think of one that I have often recommended. You know what? Look, I'll, with the massive caveat that I do not often recommend books to people. Okay. I don't. I would say the two that I find myself recommending to people are either The Untethered Soul 
or the four hour work week. Kind of like weird books to be recommending to people, but generally like I'll have people who are, who feel comfortable asking me about a book that will help them from a meditative spiritual perspective. And I really like the mind tricks that the, the untethered soul pulls off while you're reading it. I really, I, th- I think, I think they're helpful for the person who might not be inclined to believe sort of spiritual stuff. And so I think that's a helpful one. I think the four hour work week is very helpful for just very, very irreverent thinking that helps you to question a lot of conventional thinking about work. It's very, very irreverent, maybe less so in 2020, but you know, if you put it in the context of when it was released, very, very irreverent. And even sometimes I'll go back and read it just because I just, I think it's so easy to get swept into commonplace thinking. And even when I pull it out today and I read it, I remember, oh, wow. Yeah. I re- wow. I can really think very differently about work. I don't use it as a template, but I use it as a sort of electric jolt to, to yeah. my thinking. Yeah. Both of those authors, Singer and Ferris, they're both definitely next level thinkers. Yes. Yes. Next for level sure. thinkers for sure. Yeah. All right. Number six, what's one thing, I know we've talked about many of these, but what's one thing you started or stopped doing in order to live or age well? Uh, drinking alcohol. It's, it's just absolute top of the list. Not even a question. And you said it's been a decade? No, 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 no. It'll be two years uh, Thanksgiving. Oh, wow. Yeah. Congrats. Uh, I mean, yeah, thank you. No, I mean, we're, we're talking like recent history for me. Yeah, that's great. I I, I have a brother who who actually died. He He was an alcoholic. He was an alcoholic and, uh, and I gave up alcohol years ago, not on any moral grounds, but I just found two things are true for me. One is my life works better. It just works better. And two, I'm, I'm less of an asshole, <laughs> Look, you know? Yes. And yes. And on a pure health level, you know, you talked about your brother. Okay. It is, it is a tool and it is an effective tool, but the side effects are significant. And especially prolonged, sustained use of the tool will kill, it will kill you. You know, it will kill you. And so for me, it's the top of the list. Wow. Wow. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Question number seven. What's one thing you wish every American knew? Oh man. I wish every American knew that race is a legal concept and not a scientific one. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Question number eight. I think it's important for people to figure this out for themselves, right? And not look to some, I mean, yes, we can learn from other people, their experience and their teachings, but I sometimes think that people have a dependency. They're expecting other people to give them the answer Mm -hmm. to this. Of all the things that we live with and in accordance to in this country race is probably the most misunderstood and it permeates so many there's not a single part of our world that it doesn't permeate and it is a made-up thing and so it's this it's this big lie that we're all living you know And it is very, very difficult to unwind it because we've lived in it for so long that it has had such significant implications for different groups of people based on it that we now have to resolve. We have to have justice for these people who have been qualified by this made up thing. And in so doing, you still are dealing with it. It's, you know, it's, you're still dealing with the thing that's not real, but you have to do it. Like, like we have to have justice. Right. And so that's, that's the tricky part of it. That's the really, really tricky part of it is it is not real. Okay. It's not real. Genetic differences are real, right? Genetic differences are real. When you look at every single species on earth and you compare the variations in the human genetic spectrum versus every other genetic spectrum. It's not even close. It's not even in the same universe, how close we are, you know, relative to every single other species. 
And that in and of itself is, you know, that, and that's also really problematic, right? So there's the problems that it has created for us amongst ourselves. And there's the problems that it has avoided us from dealing with vis-a-vis all the other species on this planet. It's really problematic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. Question number eight. What's the most important or useful thing you've learned about making relationships work? I think what I've learned is that you have to be, you have to be radical in your ownership of the relationship and your acceptance of your lack of control of the other person. And you have to develop an indefatigable practice of compassion and forgiveness for the other person and yourself. All right. Question number nine, aside from compound interest, what's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about money or what's something you're always sure to do with it or you never do with it? Next to race, money is probably the next biggest made up thing. (laughs) I was going to say some people might put religion in there, but yeah, religion's fading. I would say, you know, if you look around 2020, like what's actually driving everything, race, race and, and the economy. Yeah. Religion's a secondary matter these days, I would say. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It it definitely has some pretty strong intersections with politics, but for sure, but not as universal, I would say. Yeah. As, yeah, as I think so. As race and, and money. And race and money are religions, by the way. I think that's the most important thing I've learned about money, you know, and I have to keep reminding myself of it and I have to keep putting it in that frame because if you don't, you'll give it more value and more power than it deserves. You know, it is not the only form of currency. It is not the only form of power. It really isn't. And yeah, it represents, and especially today, its, its role has changed, you know, its role today. Yeah, you know, actually, this is probably not true. It's always represented future value. It really represents future value today. And that's the problem with it is future value of what? Future value of a world where, like, you know, we're not going to face climate change. Future value of a world where we're not going to deal with racial justice or gender justice. Future value of what? You know what I mean? Future value of a narrative that's really struggling right now. That is, that is not driving well with reality, right? And so if it can't help us to change the narrative, it will be devalued because reality will not be devalued. That, that, this reminds me of that, that saying, I believe, was attributed to Chief Seattle about when all the rivers have been cut or all the forests have been cut and all the rivers have been fished, then man will learn he cannot eat money. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Look, man, I. I'm very, very, yeah. I mean, this, this goes back to my, to my second thing. I think that you asked me about, you know, I'm, I'm very, very concerned is not the right word because I feel like I know how much I can do and it's not enough as an individual. And so it really is going to depend on us collectively as a race, like, the, you know, and I'm just not sure the jury is out. It's not in yet. You know, um, I maintain hope, but I also, we're not, we're not talking about it. You know, we're not talking about it. We're, you know, we, we, you know, we make fun of a, of a, of a teenage girl with Asperger's who tries to make us have a, you know, have a grown up conversation about it. Right. We're in denial. You know, we're in denial collectively. Well, it's uh, maybe, maybe a, a strange thing to take comfort in, but you know, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross laid out the what is it? The five stages of grief. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's just a stage. <laughs> stage. Look, this is my hope. This is where my hope is, is anchored is that we, we are moving through the grief to the acceptance, <laughs> yeah, to the acceptance and, and, the, and, and, and ultimately then the, the action. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, thank you for that. Those are very sobering responses to the enlightening light around, but th- thank you for, for sharing them and, th- and congratulations. You've survived it. Um, so the last, <laughs> the last part of it here is, is speaking of money. Uh, one thing I have done to express, to begin to express my gratitude to you is, um, I have made a, a micro loan to an entrepreneur in Senegal. 
uh, through Kiva.org. So this is to a group of women entrepreneurs who are named Ada, Ada, Awa. There's two Awas, two Adas, Kauda, Senobu, Awa. There's three Awas and Nafi. And they will use this money to buy fertilizer and seed and pay for other labor and related expenses. So um, thank you for having a conversation with me and giving me a reason to go make a micro loan to someone on the other side of the planet. That is amazing. That's the best thing anyone has ever done for me that, you know, as a result of a podcast by far, number one, not even, there's not even a close second. Thank wow. you for doing that. Well, That's amazing. No, it's, it's my pleasure. I want to start by asking you about the fact that your book started five years ago. As we record this, it's November, 2020, but you began this in 2015 as a Kickstarter project. Your book that we're talking about here is create and orchestrate the path to reclaiming your creative power. And I haven't asked you to share this. So maybe we start with the writing thing, the writing thing here, which is who did you write this book for and why? And then let's talk about why you started it as a Kickstarter. Yeah. So I, I wrote this book for aspiring entrepreneurs. I wrote this book for the, the me that could never quite find the right mentor, the right voice, the, you know, I mean, I, I wrote it because I felt called to write it. That was, that was really it. The interesting thing about being called to write it five years ago is I absolutely did not have the stuff to deliver it five years ago. Okay. But I wouldn't have known that. I just knew I was called to do it and I had enough credibility and social proof to get a Kickstarter across the line. Yeah. I, I've talked to more than a hundred authors on this show. I've never had anybody who started their book as a Kickstarter. Yeah. I, I was crazy. This is really what it boils down to. And I, and I did not understand. I was not an author when I launched the Kickstarter, right? I was a, a developing entrepreneur. Okay. Over the course of the last five years, I became an author. I learned what it took to write a book. I had the experiences necessary to deliver on the promise of the book that I made in 2015, but it took another four years to, to get those. You know, I finished, I really finished writing the book December of 2019. That was the, that was the end. And now along the way, I, I mean, I think one might hear that and say, okay, it took you that long to like get through the book. The reality is I probably wrote two and a half books over that period of time in terms of words, right? But I wrote, a, you know, I experienced some very difficult things. Um, I was not sober for the entirety of that process. I was not always in the healthiest place in terms of processing and be able to extract the wisdom, the real, like I wasn't always in the right place in terms of humility. I wasn't necessarily always ready to talk clearly about failure. And so it took me, you know, it took me four years to get there. And then, and then I had to spend half a year uh, working through the, the, the process of um, working through the process of, of getting it published. So it was really, you know, it was really like a, like a four year writing process and, and half a year of, of self-publishing, uh, working with Brad. You mentioned in the acknowledgements that you worked with someone named Claire and you share that you submitted what you thought was the manuscript back in 2017. So after having worked on it a couple of years and you're like, Hey, I'm done. <laughs> you take it from here. But Claire sent you a message back. What did she say? She said, all I can tell you is keep writing. And, and what was her role? Was she a collaborator, an editor, somebody she at a publisher? Was, she was a guide. She was a guide. She is an author. And I paid her some money. I wasn't really sure what I paid her money to do, but it wasn't a ghost write. I was very clear. I want to write this book. But I knew I didn't know how to write a book. And so I hired another writer to not really edit but more help me go through the process of understanding how to write a book. And probably the most important thing that she did was she helped me frame up chapters and she helped me frame up what it took to deliver a chapter. Hmm. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Before. Yeah. And yeah. so for a guy who lives and works in frameworks, <laughs> it was massive, right? It was massive. And then, and then she was, she was the person who didn't let me, it's interesting. She was kind of like a, like a book therapist for me, right? I mean, there was a there was a point where I really felt like a failure because it just was in my mind, it's funny now that it's done, it's like there's no way it could have been done in any shorter period of time. 
but it was taking a while. And I felt like I was letting everyone down and I was going through something very difficult. She was a person who I could go to and say, Hey, here's what happened. And, you know, I, the part you mentioned, I think I said in maybe the last chapter of the book, but in the acknowledgements, I say to her, thanks for, I think it's like, thanks for being there on that really dark day or something like that. Yeah. And for listening, listening on that one very dark day. Yeah. And, and she knows what that means. You know, no one else knows what that means, but it was really, really helpful to have someone there who listened and didn't really beat me up, but also wouldn't let me ship a bad book. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's great. Yeah. So anyway, what a gift to have someone like that. Yeah. What was the moment that you knew you were going to write this book? So it, it happened shortly after I did a TEDx talk. Um, I did a TEDx talk here in Nashville and that was my first real breakthrough as a public speaker. But, you know, even to rewind back to early parts of our conversation, that was the moment in which I understood that my story had value. I, you know, I wanted to do a TEDx talk because I, I was suffering from a serious case of ego. And then as I went through the process of putting it together, they had a coach for, for, you know, the, the, the speakers, this was 2014. And uh, the coach is this guy, Scott Schwartley, who has written several books on the art of presentation and, you know, has worked with big CEOs and Guy Kawasaki on his presentations. So this is like a legit guy. And I went in with my presentation with him and I was kind of thinking I was, you know, uh, big stuff. And he, he just kind of tore it up, man. You know what I mean? And like showed me all the places where I was a me too. And you know, it's way too many points. I think I had like seven points. He was like, dude, you got to still at the three, you know, like this, is, you know, this is crazy. And so I left that first, I was mad. And then after I slept on it, I realized, oh man, he's right. I have, he knows way more than I do about this. I have a lot of work to do. And so I put in a true 40 hour prep session before I delivered the, 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 the speech. And so that was that was slide creation. It was practice. It was recording it and listening to it over and over again. It was doing dry runs. And so when I got on stage, you know, I, I, I knew, I knew the, I knew the talk. And so I spent so much time in the prep for the talk, trying to be good enough, you know, to deserve to be on the TEDx stage. I still hadn't faced what was the ultimate piece of self doubt, which was, does this even matter? You know what I mean? And when I finished, there was a, you know, standing ovation for the talk. Okay. That was fine. But I still didn't believe that, you know, but afterwards I was out in the hallway and a young teenage girl, teenage girl walked up to me and she said, that that was so incredible. And I'm going to write those words, believe partner up and orchestrate on a piece of paper. And I'm sticking it on my ceiling. So I see it every morning when I wake up, that was the beginning of me knowing you know, oh, I really can influence people. You know what I mean? And then starting to feel an obligation to do so. And so that, you know, it was probably some months after that, that I realized I needed to write the book. Wow. You know, I realize I'm only, you know, I only know of you, what I've read online and I've read your book and, you know, watched some videos and we've had this conversation, but so I realize I'm seeing a few data points, glimpses of an entire lifetime but I'm seeing a pattern I see in my own life, which is, you know, that an awareness comes, it's almost like waves and then it it returns. And it's almost like we don't hold on to it or we don't fully grasp it. And so it's got to come back. Life will present that same awareness in another form. And whether it was with the women in the prison and getting the sense that your story had power and then, you know, on the TEDx stage and who knows, maybe still today, but what's your sense of that? Do you feel like we have a core awareness that we're, like striving to grasp or a question we're trying to answer and the work we do is just different expressions of that. You know, I mean, Bruce Lee said it, we're, we're, we're water and we take on the qualities of that, which we fit into. And that's usually time and circumstances. Right. And so, and that, and those time and circumstances change. And so, yes, we, we are affected by the seasons, you know, literally and figuratively. 
And uh, I think the more cycles you have on this earth, the more you see that pattern and you get comfortable with that pattern and you start to kind of just let that pattern happen. You know, I'm in one of those phases right now that is much more tactical and I only find comfort in the knowledge that this is not forever, but I, I, but it is not the most fulfilling time. It's not the most inspiring time, you know, but I know that it's these tactical moments that create that create the credentials that enable me to have influence, right? And so it's like we haven't spent any time in this conversation talking about uh, talking about my my involvement with the pro soccer team, and I love that. Okay, but I can tell you, like, there's a lot of conversations that I have that I have because of that, right? You know what I mean? And now we've had this really long, fantastic conversation that I really value and is going to make the rest of my day and my weekend really great, right? I love that. You know, I love that. And, and, and these are the kinds of things that, that I would love to stay in all the time, but there, there is the, okay, but why, why you kind of thing, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, I find that I, that I have to uh, continue to show up in these, in these tactical sort of accomplishment oriented ways for seasons. This is one of them. I'm good enough at it to, to do it and get it done. It's not my favorite thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you there. So just just a few more questions about about writing, if if you don't mind. One thing one thing I'm really curious about is how did you? So going back to the concept of time, the time budget, how you organize your time, as a practical matter to get the book written. How did you? What were the habits and routines you used to get the book done, to get those words on the page? I never landed anything good. Never. I never figured out anything good on this front. It's the thing that most scares me about considering writing another one, which I am very much considering. But I'll tell you the only thing that worked, that, that actually, when I think back on the process, that I can say, oh, measurable progress was made. The only thing that ever worked was leaving, going somewhere by myself for days. So I finished it by going to a cabin and not like, I'm in a cabin, let me like walk around the woods. No, I'm in a cabin and I wake up and I put on a pot of coffee and I stay there until I go to sleep. <laughs> and the only time I leave is when I absolutely have to get up and stretch and go get a frozen pizza from someplace, right? And then I get back to the work. And I did that a couple times. And in those couple of passes, I had the sustained amount of time and to arrive in the focus where I really could live in the words, you know, cause I don't know. I mean, I think there are different people for whom this is not as difficult. I'd like to think having been through it, I've developed a competency that I didn't have before. And I believe that's true. Actually, I, be- I believe next time it will not be as hard. There's a lot of things I understand now that I didn't understand the first time. Okay. But 50 plus thousand words is a lot of words and it's fairly easy to get lost in that many words. You know what I mean? Like where they just sort of like wash over and deliver a great book. You got to be able to get into every word. Oh yeah. Every single word. And I think that requires space. And I would say that's probably most valuable for your listeners who are developing who have not yet arrived as like published authors, right? You know what I mean? If you're a published author, especially if you've done two or three of these things, yeah, you probably got a better handle on it and you can probably, it's probably easy for you to get into that zone and get to each word. But for me, that was, that was the biggest learning was just, wow, man, if you want to deliver a good, forget a great book, right? Cause to get a great book, you got to more than that. You got to premise and you got to have just really, you know, incredible phrasing and just, you know, yeah, yeah. Be, Amazing to deliver a great book, but to do a good one, a good or a very good one, you got to be able to get to every word and look at that word and say, this word belongs. It belongs in this book. It belongs in this sentence. It, it has meaning. Right. And that's, that's hard. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. If it were easy, more people would have done it already for sure. And someone pointed out to me once, there are more than a million books on Amazon right now that have zero sales. That's amazing. Yeah, so it's one thing to write a book. It's another to write a book people want to read or will tell their friends about. It really is. And, and I think 
now that I'm on the other side of it, man, it was so painful to have not delivered the book for so long, but I am so grateful that I didn't just push it out because, you know, I have good friends who have never in life uh, propped me up. You know what I mean? Like, it's (laughs) not their job. It's not their job. Okay. And who, who have unprompted publicly said, all right, I bought this book because it's my dude, but like this book is valuable, you know, and, and, and I have not sold zero books. No, no. You've, in fact, you, you've been humble, but it, it is an Amazon bestseller. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, that's no small feat either. That's, that's great. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's done well and um, it continues to sort of have waves and people recommend it. And I'm very grateful for how it turned out. That's awesome. What were some of the tools and technologies that were helpful for you? In whether it was organizing research, collecting stories, just getting the writing done, what was what did you find was helpful? I started with Scrivener as as the writing app. Not sure I would do that again, but it was it was helpful because it was sort of it's designed for writing a book or or a screenplay. It's designed for big project writing, so it, it does allow you to kind of organize lots of different drafts and thoughts and pieces of research. I might go back to it. So Scrivener was the, the, the main app that I used. And then Pro Writing Aid was what I used for my pre-copy editor edit. So like before I turned it in, the real big cleanup job, you know, probably cut a good 7,000 words out with that. Uh, I've I've never heard of it. Pro writing aid is a software. It's software. Yeah. So, so a lot of people have heard of Grammarly, right? Sure. And I feel like Grammarly is really nice for like blog posts and, and articles and emails and things like that. You know, six page Amazon, like briefs that you'll write in your company. Um, Pro writing aid, I feel like is it's like Grammarly, but it's for authors. It's like, if you're really writing a book, this is something you'll want to carve out, you know, a good two days of time, a good 16 hours and run your book through it and let it reveal all the issues. And it's on you to make decisions about what it's telling you. It's not like you just go, oh yeah, you fixed it all because you'll get a bunch of junk if you do that. But it does bring out issues, lots of issues. You know, the clarity of your writing, the run on sentences, the repetition, the you know, the grammar, the, you know, the lack of using, you know, robust cinema synonyms. So it's like, it will bring out all of these writing things. You know, it's a, it's a pro writer's aid. That's what it is. And it's, you know, and what I love about it is, okay, yes, yeah, sure. It's software, but you're learning while that, while that's happening. So like next, next time you'll, you'll write better on the first pass, you know, cause it's only pro it's only programmed with human best practices and human rules. It's not like, you know, it's not AI or something. So yeah, that's interesting. Very cool. Well, thanks for for turning me on to that. I'll definitely check it out. Yeah. Did you write with music? In other words, if this book had a soundtrack, if it had a soundtrack, what would it be? I have to say that for me, music is entirely distracting, and I try over and over again and fail over and over again to uh, to use it. It it just does not work for me. I need to get into the words and I need that focus. And I need, I need for the words and the sentences and the paragraphs and the chapters to be their own music, their own composition. Right. And, and anything else is not helpful to me doing that. So that's not even, not even instrumental. No, no, for me, for me, it is not helpful. It was just, my brain doesn't work well in that, in that way. Okay. Last couple questions here. What have you learned when it comes to marketing and promoting a book? Yeah. So I've, I've learned some things. I've learned some things. So, so one, <laughs> you know, these are things I've had to try to tell uh, new, new authors. You really want to have, and well, first of all, there are two different paths here. Um, there is, you get, you get a publishing deal or you're doing it on your own. And I ultimately think they're basically the same. You know, people look at James Clear all the time. If he he's sort of like the author of the moment. I, I I feel like you know, Atomic Habits is just like continuing to gain all this steam, and they forget all the all the articles he wrote on his blog. You know, and and that audience that he built 
prior yeah. to the book, right? And, and I think you have to leverage online. The reality is like on writing is, is largely happening online outside of book format today. And you have to use online and not necessarily from a writing perspective, but you have to use online to build an audience that will anticipate and want your book when it's launched. Uh, that's, you know, that's how I became an Amazon bestseller. Not, not because I released the book and everyone just learned about it and flooded to it. It's because I had anticipation from, you know, hundreds, if not, you know, more than a thousand people wanting to to get the book. Okay. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is you don't really know what's going to hit, but I will tell you, generally speaking, online media is better than broadcast media, right? Or print media. And so podcasts are fantastic. YouTube channels are fantastic. Instagram channels are fantastic, but you don't necessarily know ahead of time, a hundred percent of the time, what's going to be the thing to work. So you got to kind of like figure that out. You know, another thing I'll say is, you know, what you're doing, having your own podcast is super helpful because it's very, very effective in developing network. I basically have come to believe I've done over 150 episodes of my own podcast now. Uh, I'm on a small hiatus while I'm doing this work that I'm doing, but I'm going to come back hard in in the next year. You know, the most important audience of my podcast are the guests that have been on my podcast. You know, um, the listeners, Mm -hmm. that's great. That's fine. But it's the network of people that are on and whatever value I provide for them and and the learnings that I do and the deepening of that relationship. You know, those things, there's a lot of reciprocity that comes in that. And so, you know, if you can create... Uh, some type of online platform, whatever is most useful to you, podcast, YouTube channel, blog, where you where you profile other people, um, and you use that to sort of build in a network that can be helpful for you in really unofficial, un, you know, unasked for ways. That's really, really great. That's really, really great. Uh, speaking, you know, the, the virtual speaking is is. We're, we're starting to figure out what virtual speaking looks like. So, you know, speaking always is a great way to sell books. Yeah. I think those are probably the big things that I, you know, that I've learned. Awesome. Thank you. And the thing I'm struck by hearing your responses is again, how, while none of this is magic, right? There's no, there's nothing that is a revelation per se. Admittedly, nothing is obvious to everyone that ultimately these are the things that trial and error, right? There are fundamentals. There are fundamentals, but at the end of the day, each of us has to figure it out for ourselves. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I can only tell you from my own experience, right? I mean, everything yeah. I'm telling you are things that I've done. The one other thing that is a little bit not as common is I worked with a local merch business, you know, Nashville Music City. There's lots of like merch businesses that do t-shirts and stuff like that for, for artists. And I just kind of thought there's not that much difference between a music artist and an author at the end of the day in 2020. And so I worked with one of them. We created some t-shirts, we created some bundles and I ordered uh, a big order of books and I signed them. And so because it's COVID-19 and you can't really do book signings, I set up my own Shopify store, worked with them to be my fulfillment partner. And I said, listen, if you want a signed book, you can buy them from my own Shopify store where I control the margins and you can get a signed book. It actually has worked really, really well. Uh, sold a bunch of books through that channel, collected data that you don't get on Amazon, right? You know yeah. what I mean? Um, through the sale. And so having that option for people who care about that has been really, really, you know, great. That's awesome. Yeah, I love, I have watched some of those interviews where you were wearing the Create shirt. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it, it works. But people bought them. Yeah, you yeah. Know? I, I want person. one. I'm, if they're still available, I'm going to buy one after they, we're done. They are. They are. They're still okay. available. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Final question here. And there's so much, we didn't talk about what you've learned from climbing mountains and, and I, I'd love, and I didn't ask you what else you wanted to talk about, but maybe someday there will be a part two. What advice or encouragement do you leave anybody listening with, whether they're building their own business, whether they are writing or a creative in some other way, or just living life? What do you leave our listeners with as a final word of encouragement or advice? I think it has to start with whatever challenge that they are dealing with is completely human and they are not in any way broken. And start there. And then I would move to both their strengths and their weaknesses are what make them uniquely qualified 
to provide some incredibly important value to the world. And they have a reason for being here. And the fun is trying to figure that out. And you figure that out by doing. So get to it. If people want to learn more from you or they want to connect with you, what would you have them do? I would have them go to my website, marcuswhitney.com, or they could choose their social network of choice, as long as it's not TikTok, <laughs> and search for me there and send me a message. I'm pretty active on, on just about all of them. Awesome. Okay. Well, Marcus, thank you again for being here. I'm, I'm so glad that we've connected. I'm grateful to, to Nexus and to David Dietz and to Rachel for connecting us. And I've loved learning about your journey. I do find it truly inspiring. I love Nashville. I haven't spent a ton of time there, but uh, I'm looking forward to returning someday. Yeah. When, when everything clears up, you'll have to come back. Yeah. You'll come back. And of course, <laughs> you'll let me know when you're here. I will. I had registered for the Nashville Marathon a couple of years back. And it turned out, uh, cause I'm part of EO. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there's, a very, actually, there's a very rich, robust EO chapter here for sure. Yeah. Well, that's what we knew. And, and so we were going to come do our retreat one year there and, and we registered and for one reason or another, we ended up canceling, but someday I'll be back. And I know that you'll be in Salt Lake at some point because Utah is the center of the universe. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, I know this much in 2022, I'm going to celebrate the reopening of the world by going to every away game uh, for Nashville Soccer Club uh, that we have in Major League Soccer. And so fingers crossed that we play Rail Salt Lake yeah. in 2022. I will definitely be there for that. That's awesome. I'll look forward to that. And you're always welcome as a guest in our home. So please do let me know when you're in town, whether it's for a stay or just a coffee or something. But uh, I will definitely let you know when this releases. It won't be until the new year sometime, but uh, I'll let you know. And then and then I look forward to staying, staying in touch and in a relationship with you. Please, please. That would be fantastic. I've really enjoyed it. Despite living in an age where we have more comforts and conveniences than ever before, life isn't working for many people. Whether it's in the developed world, where we're dealing with depression, anxiety, addiction, divorce, jobs we hate, relationships that don't work, or people in the developing world who don't have access to clean water or sanitation or healthcare or education or who live in conflict zones. There's a lot of people on the planet that life isn't working very well for. If you're one of those people, I invite you to connect with me at goodliving.com. I've created Life's Best Practices Breakthrough Coaching to help you navigate the transitions that we all go through. Whether you've just graduated school, you're going through a divorce, you just got married, you're headed into retirement, you're starting a business, you just lost your job, whatever it is you're facing, I've developed a 36-week course that you go through with me and a community of achievers and seekers who are committed to improving their own lives and the lives of others. So through this online program, you will have the opportunity to go deep into every area of your life, explore life's big questions, create answers for yourself in community get clarity and accountability. If that's something you're interested to learn about, I invite you to contact me directly at brian at brianmiller.com or by visiting goodliving.com.